All right, good evening once again. Here we are. It's, uh, what day is it? It's Wednesday. For everybody who's at home and has lost track of the days, it is Wednesday. You're halfway through the week. Only two more days to homeschool, and then you have the weekend. Um, all right, that was weird. <laughs> Let's not do that again. Um, and so that's where we're at. So it's Wednesday now, and welcome to once again for Wednesday within the Holy Week. Previously on Holy Week, we had Palm Sunday on Sunday where Jesus was entering Jerusalem and everybody was partying and having a good time with him being there. Um, and then we came into Monday, which was something else. That was when he drove everybody out of the temple. It's funny when uh, the pastor kind of forgets what he's been talking all week, huh? So that was spring cleaning. And so that's what we had on Monday with spring cleaning. We learned that uh, Jesus wants us to clean the temple, which is your body, clean the temple of the Holy Spirit, but also be open, approachable, so that people will like you. All oh, darn it, people like you. And so then yesterday we had, um, goodness, there it is. It's just straight gone. We had Jesus Speaks, because as we look at, it's Tuesday, it's the one day. I should really put my recap in my notes, so I actually know what I'm looking at, but I don't do the recaps in the notes, and I probably should. Um, so come uh, yesterday, we had Jesus' big teaching day. That was probably the day that he taught the most in the whole week. He taught every day, but that was the day he taught the most. He covered the most ground, and he... Um, discussed many things with, um, with Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes, and, and we just got to really see what Jesus had to say um, about things. To, so today, we come into Mark chapter 14 once again. Yesterday, we were in Mark chapter 12. So as you can tell, we ended in Mark 12, 34. Today, we're picking up Mark 14, 1. So anybody who thought I went long yesterday, you don't know the half of how long yesterday could have been. We didn't even do Mark chapter 13. And so, because we're only trying to get through what he did that day. So we were looking at just that. So today, we're going through Mark chapter 14, verse 1 through 11. That's the entire day of Wednesday that the Bible records, is Mark 14, 1 through 11, and I believe it's Matthew 26, like 1 through 17 or something like that. Wednesday is only recorded in um, two of the Gospels as a whole. I believe Luke has a little snippet about what Mark does the first um, uh, two verses on. And so that's about it for Wednesday. So we're just going to skip Wednesday altogether go right to Thursday. No, I'm just kidding. We're going to do Wednesday because that's what we're doing. We're going through a week in the life of Jesus, his final week as he sprints towards the cross, his marathon week, the holy thon, as we've grown to call it. Well, I think Hardy and Allison like to laugh at me while I say it. So I have coined it as a holy thon. And so now let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that today you would speak to us, Lord, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would do a mighty and powerful and wonderful work as, as we look forward to what it is you want to show us and what it is you want to do in our lives, Lord. And we praise you, we thank you, we worship you, and today I pray that you would speak into our lives, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. So, hopefully, I'm not being too loud, but Hardy says it's good when I'm loud. Because then you guys don't have to turn the TV up so loud. And we don't want to be blowing your speakers. So Mark chapter 14, verse 1. It was now two days before the Passover. Two days before the Passover. And the festival of unleavened bread. Um, oh, sorry. You need to pay attention to punctuation, Ryan. So let's try this again. It was now two days before Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The leading priests and teachers of religious law were still looking for an opportunity to capture Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during Passover celebration, they agreed, or the people may riot. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with beautiful 
with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard. She broke up the jar and poured the perfume over his head. Some of those at the table were indignant. Why waste such, a, such expensive perfume, they asked. It could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor. So they scolded her harshly. But Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why criticize her for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you, and you can help them whenever you want to, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. So let's discuss it. He says, no, I'm just kidding. Not right now. We will discuss it, but not this moment. Sorry, sorry. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, went to the leading priest to arrange to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted when they heard why he had come, and they promised to give him money. So he began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. This is horrible. I mean, it just really hit me right now, this moment, that when then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12 disciples, went to the leading priests. These are the priests, the people who are supposed to bring God to the people and the people to God. They're supposed to be the conduit between God and the people. Then Judas Iscariot went to the leading priest who arranged to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted when they heard why he had come and they promised to give him money. They were delighted to kill Jesus. These religious leaders, these people who are in charge of the temple, who would sacrifice animals and bring it before the Lord to repent for the sins of the people, they were delighted to kill someone. That is sad. That's a sad testimony to the conditions of the hearts of the religious leaders of the time. Very sad. Very sad. It's huge. Very sad. And so... But the thing we need to look at here is why is this story even here? Why in the midst of everything does Jesus bring this story or the, does God inspire the authors, the author Mark, and for all intents and purposes, in case you didn't realize it, Mark was not one of the disciples of Jesus. He came after. Um, for all intents and purposes, they believe that this, this version here, Mark, is... is the gospel of Peter. They believe that Mark got it from Peter. And so that's where it's at, and he's going through, and he's sharing this, and yet this instance has a significant enough impact upon um, the author that it gets put into here, not just here, but also in Matthew. And so it has that impact in Matthew as well. And so what occurs here, we have the woman, we have Simon the leper, we have Jesus, and the disciples. So those are the people we're looking at here. First, we're in the home of Simon the leper. Okay, so this guy is named Simon. He was a man who had previously had leprosy. So who this guy is, he's a guy that Jesus had healed. I'm sure it's recorded in the Gospels, but I did not go look it up. I am sorry. Um, but that's who he is. And so my guess here is that he was healed by Jesus as far as to the leprosy. Um, so he was in this guy's house eating, and this woman comes up. The interesting thing, it says a woman came in. It didn't say who this woman was. It doesn't give a name. It doesn't give a relationship. It doesn't give anything about her except for it tells us that she is a woman. She has a beautiful alabaster jar full of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard. How many of you guys would like to buy some nard perfume? Kind of sounds gross, right? But it's a perfume made from a plant called spike nard. It's Indian. And so they would go through and it was very coveted and very desired by these people that it was a very pleasant aroma and very strong. So everybody who's into essential oils right now, dude, this, this girl is right up your alley. Okay? Because it was made from the essence of nard. So the essential oil of spike nard. And so that's where, she, where it's at. And so that's what she's got. But she comes and she broke open the jar and poured the perfume over his head. 
Now we see by the reaction of the disciples that this was an extremely expensive perfume. They said here that it could, be, could have been sold for a year's wages. If you don't know how the money system worked back then, a denarius was basically a day's wages. Okay, so it would have been 360 denarii. So that's a lot since, since everybody knows what the conversion rate of denarii is to American dollars, right? But if we go with the idea that it is a year's wages, once again, we got to figure out, is this Oklahoma year? Is this California year? Is this New York, York year? How about we just go with an easy $50,000? Sounds like a pretty significant price, right? This jar goes for the same price as basically a Camaro. So she could have traded her jar of, out, her, of her, her jar of perfume made from nard for a Camaro. So that kind of gives you a perspective of the price range we're looking at, how expensive this was. So what would cause this woman to do this? And this morning, I was really struggling with what it was that the Lord had for me to share about this woman breaking a jar over Jesus' head and pouring out the contents on it. Notice I said over his head, not on his head. That would have been a completely different story. But... In this case, she broke the jar, she poured out the contents on his head, and what would cause her to do that with such an expensive fragrance? And if this were a one-off story, we would probably be thinking, well, it, it's, it's a devotion, it's, it's, who knows, maybe she just really felt she needed to do it. I was trying to think of it. It says she's a woman there in how, the house of Simon the leper, so maybe she's a relative or a servant of Simon the leper. And she was just overcome with gratefulness, with joy towards the Lord for what he had done um, in healing Simon the leper. And so she's just overcome with this. But the cool thing about this is there was two other instances where somebody poured out one of these same jars upon people. And the interesting thing to note here is these jars would have been used as almost like a life savings for this woman, kind of like her security blanket. If nothing ha else goes on, I've got this jar and it can hold me over for a year. Not, not by drinking it or anything, but they can sell it and be safe and, and good for a year. Or they can use it as a dowry for, for someone wanting to marry them. Or there's these, all these different uses for something this valuable. And so it was worth more to this woman than just the finances of it. It's worth more to her because it was the security and the future hope that she was breaking out and offering to Jesus as well. So, many people think that this woman was Mary, maybe Mary Magdalene, Mary, Mary, maybe Mary, the mother of uh, the sister of Lazarus, not the mother, the sister of Lazarus. But, what I do know is that in John chapter 12, we have another account of a very similar thing happening. So in John chapter 12, verse 1, it says six days before the Passover celebration. So this is four days ago. Four days ago, someone did something very similar to what this woman just did. So Jesus is just flowing with spike nard right now. And so six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany. Same town even. The home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume. It would have been good to bring a 12-ounce jar. I don't even know how much a 12-ounce jar is. What's that? A can of soda. Good call. Good call. So for anybody who doesn't know, Hardy is behind the microphone, and he just told me that it was a can of soda. So a can of soda is 12 ounces. So that's how big this jar is. She dumped a can of soda of perfume. And so Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with with the fragrance, and Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said the perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief, 
And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole, from, stole some for himself. Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you. You will not always have me. When all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him and also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. So a lot of people like to put these two stories together because they're so close in proximity to time and because the, the instances are so similar. The difference is in the John account, we have the listing of the woman's name. In the Mark account, we do not have the listing of the woman's name. In the John account, we have that they're at Lazarus's house. In the Mark account, we have that they're at Simon the leper's house. Okay, I'm pretty sure the disciples knew where they were, so that would be an awful interesting thing to confuse. Um, they all would have been more than aware of when, when um, Passover was. The John account has it six days before Passover. The Mark account has it two days before Passover. And the Matthew account has it two days before before Passover. So as we look at all these, there's enough differences to be confident, at least in my book, that these are two separate occasions going on here, that these are two separate occasions. And so the interesting thing also is that in the Mark account, she poured it on his head. In the John account, it was Mary pouring it on his feet. And so, so there's enough there. But we see that the disciples' reaction was the same in both accounts. And so it's just very interesting. They are very set on feeding the poor. Nothing wrong with that. That's a great thing. They're very, but they're very set on it, even to the point that I think they're missing what's actually happening. So what's going on here with Mary? We know that Mary is a woman who, who ha had a great love for Jesus. She had a great admiration for Jesus. She desired to worship at his feet and hear him teach and do many great things. She wanted to see Jesus and be with him. And so my assumption here is that Mary's coming and she's doing this as an act of worship. The significant thing about here it wasn't even the jar of perfume that was poured out on his feet. It says she poured it on his feet, wiping his feet with her hair. Have you ever tried to dry something with your hair? Well, one, I don't have enough hair to even try with, so I don't bother trying. But I do know hair does not make a great towel. So the significance of it is she's pouring out what potentially could be her greatest possession, her greatest, her greatest possession, and wiping it with his feet, treating her great, her, her glory, her beauty, which women in these times, their hair was their beauty. It, their hair was very much associated to, to their sense of, of being beautiful and cared for and honored. And so she poured out her greatest possession and wiped it with her honor, treating it like a towel, basically seeing that all this stuff is nothing before the Lord. And that's where Mary was when she did this. This was nothing that she poured it out because she just wanted so much to bless Jesus. And I believe that's what this woman in Mark is doing, is that she is blessing Jesus. There is another account of a woman doing the same thing with an alabaster jar filled with oil. This was a common thing at the time, but not so common that it was cheap. It was, it was common for people to want this, but because of its value. It's kind of like for a while there, everybody's saying, oh, you've got to buy gold. You've got to buy gold. And so people were stockpiling gold, not because gold was common, but there's a lot of people that had it because of its security value, that it maintains its value. Well, it was the same with this this perfume. It maintained its value. So people would go through and um, let me do what every pastor tells all you guys to do and silence your cell phone because mine just tried to get all kinds of crazy loud. And, um, and so what we see here, you guys, is that these women are using this security blanket, using their gold, if you will, 
in their worship of Jesus. But in Luke chapter 7, this one's a little bit longer, so I'm making up for Mark being short by adding all kinds of verses about other stuff from other Gospels. So, in Luke chapter 7, verse 37, it says, When a certain immoral woman from the city heard he was eating, Jesus was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. So same stuff. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her, te her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them with her hair. Then she kissed his feet, putting perfume on them. Then the Pharisee who had invited him saw this. He said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Cool thing answered his thoughts. He didn't even say it out loud. Jesus was like, Simon, not Simon the leper, different Simon. This is Simon the, the, the Pharisee. And so he says, then Jesus answered his thoughts. He said, Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people. 500 pieces of silver to one and 500 pieces to the other. It's a lot of money. Even now, it's a lot of money. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Huh? Who do you suppose loved him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon. So now he's looking at this woman at his feet. And back then they reclined. I'm not going to lay down because then you wouldn't see me. But they would recline while they leaned at the table. So I'm making kind of a funny posture right now, but you can't see it. And so they would recline. And so the woman is kind of right back there, right? And so he turned. He's looking at the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but, he ha but she has washed them with the tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, and she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. So all these things he just mentioned, the water for his feet and, and the drying, the kiss for his head, the oil, all of this was common. You would do this to uh, an uncle you don't even like that came to visit. You would do all these things. And this Pharisee failed to do even the common courtesy to Jesus when he came in. And he's pointing out that this woman is going beyond what that would be is she's, she's weeping over his feet and the tears are falling and she's, she's wiping it off. She's cleaning his feet with her tears. She's then kissing his dirty, muddy feet that she's been cleaning with her hair. She's kissing it and pouring perfume on it. And so she's just totally loving on Jesus right now. That's what we're seeing is this woman is just broken at his feet and pouring it out. And so he says in verse 47, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love, but a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So we see these out of these two accounts, we have Mary where there's this, there's this outpouring of worship, this outpouring of devo devotion for Jesus. We have this other woman um, who's at his feet and she's weeping and you're seeing just, just the overwhelming joy and love pouring out of her from the brokenness of her own sin being poured out as, at his feet, realizing how much she needs him, realizing how much she's going to be saved from and realizing how much God has done in her life and how much she has failed the Lord. And so we see this outpouring of worship from both of them. And the interesting thing I see here is that ultimately it's in these outpouring. Our worship should be a sacrifice to the Lord. 
Our worship should be a sacrifice to the Lord. Both these women have sacrificed in, in finance, in security, in, in um, uh, their, their futures. They've sacrificed their honor in their hair. They've sacrificed all these things as an outpouring to the Lord. In fact, we see in Philippians 4.18, Paul is saying, at the moment, I have all I need. And more, I am generously supplied with the gifts you sent me from Epaphroditus. They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. So that is something that's pretty cool because they gave these things to help supply Paul with his needs, showing what Paul needs. And what he's saying is that they were a sweet-smelling sacrifice and is acceptable and pleasing to God. But wait, they didn't give it to God. They gave it to Paul. But yet in serving and ministering to Paul, they were serving and ministering God in that they were furthering his ministry and doing the work that, that he was doing for God's ministry. And so they offered this sacrifice. In fact, in Romans, we were told that our lives should be a living sacrifice for the Lord. And so that's where I see this woman is coming from. It's from a place of sacrifice, a place of worship. And on top of that, she was fulfilling an even greater thing and an even greater desire, a greater calling than what she even realized. Because when the guys decided to jump all over her for it, Jesus pointed out that she has done what she could. So this is what she could. She's giving Jesus all that she can do. So it's saying she has done what she could and anointed my body for burial ahead of time. So what I'm seeing here is you have this woman who has done this thing and she doesn't even realize the full significance of what she's doing. And honestly, I think there's a lot of times when we're helping people, we're serving people, we're doing things for the Lord, and we don't even see what the end result of that is going to be. Um, as I was thinking about this concept and this idea, I was thinking about when I went to Ukraine. This was, oh gosh, forever ago, okay? I was not old back when I went then. I think I was like 19, 20, something like that. So we're talking like 22 years ago. I went to Ukraine. I remember we were there. We are in Kiev. Okay, if you don't know where Kiev is, guess what? Neither do I. But I've been there. It's in Ukraine. It's the capital city of Ukraine. It'll be on the map with the star. Okay? Um, we have a tendency of calling it Kiev. K-I-E-V. Um, and so we were there. None of that has anything to do with my story except for we were in Ukraine. That's all you really need to know. And so... But we were there, and we were sharing with people in this square, and there's all these people. And you have to realize these people came from communism and all this, and we were talking to this one babushka. So uh, uh, she's, an older, she's an old lady, and she's there, and she's talking to us. She's talking about what it was like under communism, which apparently it was good for her, and things are rougher for her now um, in, with capitalism being the system. But that's because corruption is rampant there um, as well. But... The woman was there, and she had a Bible with her. The cool thing about it was she was a believer. She was a believer before the communists came in, took over. Soviet Union wiped everything out, destroyed Bibles. So having an actual Russian Bible, a complete Russian Bible, was like a miracle to have it. And they were worth something. They were hard to find. They were very hard to find. And this woman had one, and she actually had it with her. I don't know why she actually had it with her in the square, but she had it. It was in her bag of stuff. And she pulled it out. She wrote a letter in the front of it, and she gave it to me. And my first thought is, what am I going to do with a Russian Bible? It's really cool having a Russian Bible because the interpreter at the time was helping me learn how to to read Russian, not that I had any idea what it was saying, but I was learning to pronounce the words. And so I had a Russian Bible, thought this was really cool. That night we're doing a big um, get together. We're doing a big thing, trying to draw people in and share the gospel with them. Afterwards, we had a lot of Russian New Testaments that we just wanted to get them out there, get the gospel into the hands of these people out in Russian, spread it around, get it, and, and there was 
this couple there that I had met earlier, they had a baby with them. Well, they received the Lord in this gathering, in this meeting. Um, this was before coronavirus, so there's well over 10 people there, and they were way closer than six feet. And so, but they were there, and there was this couple, they had a little baby. So they were baby Christians with a baby, baby Christian. And so, um, but they came to get the New Testaments, and we ran out before they could get it. But lo and behold, here's this English-speaking American who has an entire Russian Bible. And I saw them leaving. I ran. I got the Bible from where I put it, and I gave them the Bible. Did that babushka know that day in the square that when she gave some, some American who only speaks English, when she gave him the Russian Bible, when she let go of this thing that had that much value to her, that it would then be later used to, by God to bless another couple who was just starting their walk. Do you think she had any idea? No. She was just giving a Bible. And yet it blessed this other couple immensely because they were able to start their walk out um, in a powerful way. And like this woman here, I don't think she, she even had a full comprehension that she was um, anointing Jesus for his burial. I don't think she was even thinking that necessarily because the disciples didn't even grasp the fact that Jesus had told them multiple times that he was going to Jerusalem to die. They just hadn't put it together. It wasn't clicking because in their idea, remember we were talking about expectations? Their expectation was Jesus was coming here to establish his kingdom, to rule and reign for all eternity. That's what is going to happen. That's what the Messiah is going to do when he comes. He's going to do that. Well, guess what? That's the second coming. That's Jesus part two, okay? And so what we have here is Jesus is going to set us free from our sins. So there is a point to establish rule and reign so that we are not trapped in our sin for all eternity. And so that's what Jesus came to do here. And that's what he's going to do. And this woman was anointing him. Now I see the disciples get crazy with her and they want to, they want to uh, chastise her. And you shouldn't have done this. That could have been sold. We could have fed the poor. And, and there's two issues with that that I see. One, this woman was worshiping God in the only way she knew how. We as a church need to recognize that people worship in different ways. One of the things I loved about David was he worshiped dancing before the Lord. As the, altar, as the ark came into the city, we talked about this the other day. As he was worshiping, he was dancing. He was in his ancient underwear, and he was, he was dancing around, and his wife didn't even like it. She called him out on it and talked about how undignified he was. And um, Jesus said, I will, or David said, I will be even more undignified before my Lord. I don't know what that means. I think he was just basically saying that, that there's no limit to what he won't do for the Lord. And so, so these guys are questioning the way she worships. And there's things that, that people do in worship that aren't wrong, but they're not my way of worshiping. I've seen people dancing in worship. I remember asking my daughter not to dance once. And people were like, oh, no, you should let her dance. I'm like, well, I know my daughter. And it starts out with just she's dancing, she's swaying, she's spinning. And it almost becomes break dancing. And she's going to just get out of control, go all Tasmanian devil, and start spinning and going crazy. And so I was trying to stop her from breaking the music equipment. And so... What was happening, though, is that she had this desire to dance before the Lord. And um, that was Cadence that was doing that. And honestly, if she wants to dance before the Lord, let her dance before the Lord. There's people I know that there's churches that dance or they, they do worship with flags and banners. Okay, it seems a little, seems a little strange to me. It's not what I'm used to. Um, but more power to them. If they want to dance with banners, let them dance with banners. It looks kind of pretty if they're in sync. And so, and I'm not talking the boy band in sync. I'm talking like they're actually going in the same, same routine. But, um, and so we need to understand that people will worship in ways that are different than us. Some people worship because they have great voices. Some people worship very loud and don't have great voices. But you know what? It's great to the Lord. It is a sweet-smelling aroma to the Lord in that sense. Why? Because they're pouring out their heart. They're worshiping him in where they're at. And I personally do not want to be a person who is going to quell worship. 
quell their worship and make them so self-conscious of themselves. Am I doing this right? Am I doing this right? Rather than let their heart that has been filled with love and respect for the Lord pour out. Now, granted, that's as long as they're doing it um, in the way that I deem right. No, granted, that's as long as they're doing it in a way that is appropriate for the Lord. Obviously, sin is not a time to... to um, is not a way to worship the Lord. Um, condemning is not a way to worship the Lord. All these different things that you can think of, okay? I'm bringing my sacrifice of crack to the Lord. No, he doesn't want it, okay? That's not a sacrifice that would be a sweet-smelling aroma to him. So obviously, we have to draw the line at what would be inappropriate for the Lord, what would be a sin and would be disgraceful to the Lord. But ultimately... Beyond that, you want to go to the beach and just yell Jesus' name and that's your worship? Then go to the beach and yell Jesus' name. Okay, you're probably going to get some funny looks. People may avoid you, which is good. That will help sustain the, the physical distancing. But if that's the way you want to worship, then worship. I don't want to be the one saying, hey, you shouldn't say Jesus' name. Not in public. No, that wouldn't be cool. And so ultimately, we need to be to where we recognize that worship is between that person and God. And if what that person is offering is a sweet-smelling aroma to God, I don't want to go and put clothespins on God's nose or to stop that sweet-smelling aroma. And so that's what was happening here. They were attacking. But on top of that, I think it's because their focus was in the wrong place. This woman was focused on Jesus. She loved Jesus. She desired Jesus. She wanted to be close to Jesus. She was looking to be with Jesus. And so she was pouring this out on Jesus. She was pouring her worship, her love, her admiration on Jesus. And what were they focused on? That could have been given to the poor. That could have been given to the poor. And so my question here is how many Marthas do we have in the church and how many Marys do we have in the church? Because in the story, Luke chapter 10, we see Jesus had just got done raising Lazarus from the dead. He's in, the, in their house. And it says, as Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village. This wasn't at that point, but same people. Okay, this wasn't after they raised Lazarus, but they're on their way to G G Jerusalem. They came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Look, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, My dear Martha, 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 Martha. You are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. One thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken from her. You guys, there's so many times we get so worked up over different ministries. We get, we've got to do this. We've got to do this. We've got to, we've got to feed the poor. We've got to help the homeless. We got to, and there is nothing wrong with that. That is all good stuff. That is stuff we need to do. But if we're doing that and losing sight of God, then we're doing it wrong. We're doing it wrong at that point in time. Because our goal as the church is not to get people fed, it's to get people to Jesus. To Jesus. Sorry, got a little southern there. And so, but that's the purpose. I can't even get a smile out of Hardy, he's so focused on other stuff now. Um, and so, but that is the purpose of what we're here for. We were not given salvation so we can give food to the hungry. We did not, we were not given salvation so we can, can, can clothe people. Those are all things, pure and undefiled religion. Yes, those are all things that are expected of us, but that was not the goal of our salvation. The goal of our salvation was to know God, to be with him, have communion with him, eat with him, spend time with him, come to know him, have his heart within us and him know us and us know him. 
That was the purpose of salvation. That was what you received. I'm sure if someone said, come to Jesus and you can feed the poor, you're like, I don't want to feed the poor because I'm selfish and I'm rotten. I'm sure if we would have been offered that, we'd be like, no. Can't we pay somebody else to go do that? But that's not what was going on. What was brought up is come to Jesus and he will set you free from your sins. Because Jesus died and rose again to pay the price for those sins. Why? Because he wants you. He wants that relationship with you. He wants to be with you. He wants to have communion with you. He wants it to be like Mar where Mary is right here, where she's in this place of intimacy. Think about it. Where do you ever see someone sitting at a person's feet just listening? As a kid, I remember every Christmas, every Christmas Eve, we'd go to um, my Aunt Betty's house. We'd go there, we'd go into the little den in the background, and one of, well, we called them uncles, one of my cousins, we found out later, is just, um, my dad is the youngest of seven, so we are so much younger than the ones from the oldest um, part of the clan, and so they were always known to us as uncles, but in actuality they were cousins. So side note, um, so one of our cousins would read from the story, Twas the Night Before Christmas. And when they read that, all the kids were on the ground in front of them, sitting on the ground, listening to everything that was going on, listening to the story, listening intensely to what it was. And we would answer, and they'd ask questions, and it was this big, lively thing. And so what I see here is that Jesus is here with his disciples, and he's teaching them. And here's Mary sitting on the ground at the Lord's feet, just listening, just soaking it in, sitting in the presence of God. And Jesus says, Martha, you're worried about all these other things, but you're missing out on the one thing. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. What's the one thing being worth concerned about? Who Jesus is and what he's saying. And that's where Mary was. That's what prompted her to pour out her alabaster flask of oil or, or perfume. That's what prompted the other woman in Simon the Pharisee's house to do it. That's what prompted, I believe, the woman who was in Simon the leper's house was this, this great desire to be with Jesus and to bless him. How awesome is that to think? How many times in our lives do we ask God to bless us? God, speak to me. God, minister to me. God, bless me. I'm in this hard place. Just provide for me. Do this. We ask so many things of the Lord. How many times do we say, God, I just want to bless you today. I want to do something that just makes your heart warm with love. I want to serve you in a way. I want to worship you in a way with my heart and my mind and my mouth that at the end of the day, you're like, you know what? That guy right there, he's pretty cool. I really like that. He blessed me today. He took this day and blessed me in it. And so that would be my hope, you guys, is that our worship wouldn't just be in words, especially right now when it's hard. It's over the internet. Things are going. The sound isn't very good. Um, well, it sounds good on our end. I'm just kidding. I mean, we're coming through a soundboard, but I don't know if your computer speakers are any good, if you're listening through the phone and you're just like, ah, like that, trying to hear it and trying to worship. It just becomes harder to get into worship, actual corporate worship that way, singing songs. So you know what? I hope throughout the day you guys are cranking mu music, you're worshiping, you're singing, you're praising the Lord, you're seeing people that need help, and you're worshiping the Lord by giving sacrifice of helps, and you're doing all these things that are ministering to people around you out of an abundance of love for them because of that relationship you have with God. Because ultimately, that feeding the poor and the hungry and the needy that he's talking about and, and where it comes from with pure and undefiled religion, it all stems from that relationship with God. That's where it all begins is in that relationship with God where he puts his love within you and his love within you reaches out to everybody else around you. He wants to minister, help, and, and provide for other people. And so that's where that comes from. It's not that it's neglected. I'm not saying neglect it, but I'm saying what Jesus was saying, which is the poor and needy you'll have with you always. They're not going anywhere. 
Hopefully there's a rotation, not the same pe old people always in that spot, and hopefully there's less tomorrow than there are today, but ultimately there will always be people who are poor and people who are needy. I know in this country we're sitting here, oh my gosh, yeah, that person's in such a hard spot. That person is living in the United States. There's lots of food. We are the upper 1% of the world. And so when people say, well, what about the 1%? You're actually talking about the 1% of the 1%. You're talking about the 0.01% is who you're talking about. Because ultimately the United States is the 1%. The industrialized Western world is the 1% of the entire world. You have homes, you have food, you have clothes. There are some people that don't have all of that of their own means, but there are, in almost every city in this country, there's a place where we can go get it. And, and even in places where this at, I know f I have friends who are in homeless ministries and, and even here they went just recently, they went and um, gave out food to the homeless who are out in the bushes. And so they went and found them and gave them food. How awesome is that? And so they're providing, but this providing isn't, that providing food isn't their, isn't their God. This providing food comes out of a ministry to people based on their love for God because that's what God has put inside their heart. That's who God gave them a love for. And that's what the disciples, I think, were starting to lose sight, which is the point is not feeding the poor. The point is knowing Jesus. And out of knowing Jesus, you then get a heart for all these other needs. You get a heart for different things. And not everybody's ministry is the same. I know people who minister in prisons. I know people who find who are in homeless ministries. I know people who worship. I know people who, who do all kinds of different things. Not everybody's ministry is the same. Why? Because we're all just different parts of the same body. And so ultimately, that's a complete side note. But the point that I'm trying to get at is that there is one thing. And that's to be at the feet of Jesus. If you don't know Jesus and you want to know Jesus, you want to be at his feet, you want to be in that place to where you can say, I know Jesus, I'm at his feet, I'm worshiping, I love my God. I have grown to love my God because he died. He rose again. He saved me from my sins. You want that? Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for giving your life as payment for my sin. Thank you for raising from the dead and removing them from me and offering me life in you. Thank you for removing my sin. I pray that you come in, that you lead me in my life and direct me in the ways to go, that you would lead me on the paths of life as I follow after you. So if you prayed that, that is awesome. Please let us know. If anybody has prayed these things throughout the entire week, please let us know because we would love to hear from you. That would be an awesome encouragement, and we just want to help you in any way we can. We even have um, some Bibles around here somewhere that we can give you. Um, so with that, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would help us to keep our eyes focused on Jesus, that we wouldn't be afraid to worship him in our life. We wouldn't be afraid to worship him with our possessions, with our life, with our time, with our efforts, with whatever it is we have. As this woman did all that she could, she did what she could. Lord, I pray that we would worship you with what we can, Lord. And that our hearts would just be an overflowing fountain of worship towards you. And that out of that worship, it would benefit the rest of the community and the rest of the state and the, the country and ultimately the world. But it all stems from you. And I pray that you would place that in our hearts, that love and admiration for you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And as always, stay safe.